as we pass people every day, we have no idea what goes on in their lives, what their jobs are, what current problems they face, if they've had severe trauma or loss, or if they're generally just good people. This means we also have no idea when we encounter someone who has just done away with another human being and then resumed their lives like it was a regular day. Here are seven people who crossed paths with people they had no idea were killers. Enjoy. Thanks to alphabetical seating, I sat in the desk immediately in front of Sean Sellers in my high school science class, right up until the day he killed his parents. At that point, he had already killed the Circle K clerk months ago. I talked to him a few times. He was pretty much weird enough that you just kind of ignored him. I do remember, however, him having a book of runes. He was trying to learn to write using them. I had a conversation or two with him about that. That was it. I'm 20. I get home from my job at the local hotel just as my girlfriend is heading off to her job at a restaurant. I have a few PBRs in the backyard while the dog pretends he can't hear me telling him not to dig holes. The sun sets, and I feel good. I go inside, feed him and myself, and then go to take the trash out. Immediately, the dog starts freaking out and barking at the garage of the property next door. It's being gutted and renovated, and no one lives there. The only people that are ever around are the work crew doing the renovations, and they were never there that late in the day. I assume it's a possum or something that has taken up residence in there and ignore it. As I'm dumping the garbage, I hear the unmistakable sound of a child crying inside. The sliding door is not completely down, but it's still not my house, and it's dark, so I just don't want to barge in. So I say, hello. I shouted into it. There was a pause and then louder crying. I call the cops. Within 10 minutes, they're on the scene asking me if I'm sure it's not a cat inside. I'm pretty sure, officer. Listen for yourself. We wait. The crying starts again. Does anyone live here, they ask. No. It's being renovated. That's enough for the cops, and they throw open the door. Inside the garage is a parked sedan with the driver's side window open, and reaching out the window is a terrified girl who could not have been older than two. The cops get her out of the car and call for backup. Soon an ambulance arrives, and a social worker, and several more police show up to secure the area and prevent any cars from leaving. Then detectives show up. Then more detectives. Fast forward a few weeks. Turns out one of the guys in the crew murdered his girlfriend, who was the foster mother of the little girl. Not knowing what to do with the girl, he drove to the work site, left her in the car and bolted, leaving the garage halfway open, presumably so someone would hear her and find her. He was apprehended and went to court. I never found out what the verdict was, but I presume guilty. Summer, 1999. My family and I took a trip to Yosemite National Park. While at the park, we stayed at a motel named Cedar Lodge. It was a really nice place in a remote part of the park. My tubby 15-year-old self came down with a huge fever and instead of infecting everyone else, my mother decided to get a separate room for me. So I'm laying in bed, sick as a dog, when the AC stops working. 
call the front desk and ask them to come and fix it. A short while later, the door just magically opens and in comes this gruff looking man with a very distinct handlebar mustache. After entering, he proceeds to just stare at me. I remember being pretty scared, but I noticed he was in the motel uniform with a tool bag, so he must be there to fix the AC. He didn't say a single word. He swiftly moved over to the AC unit, knelt down, and began fixing it. Every few minutes, he'd look back at me like I was a piece of meat. The entire time, he never said a word. After he was finished, he walked to the door and stopped as if he was going to say something, but didn't. He just closed the door, and that was that. Flash forward a few days later, we arrived back in Florida after a great trip, besides me getting sick. My grandparents and I were watching the world news tonight with Peter Jennings. The main story? A serial killer was caught in Yosemite National Park, and I immediately started getting a strange sensation in my spine. They said his name was Carrie Stainer. Then a picture of Cedar Lodge appeared on the television. At this point, I'm about to wet myself because I just know I'm going to see that mustache on the screen next. And I did. Evidently, he murdered four women right before we traveled to the park. He could have easily killed me, no problem. It's strange when I think about those gazes he gave me. As if he were contemplating where he would bury my body. I traveled for 10 days overland in Asia with a guy who I later found out was wanted by Interpol. Apparently, he had decapitated his wife and thrown her body in the Ohio River. I was 26 at the time. The thing of it was, this fellow was extremely testy and his eyes were lifeless, blank looking. I sensed something was up with him, but had no idea what the real scoop was. He was not your usual chill fellow backpacker, that much was clear. We parted ways after crossing the India-Pakistan border in Punjab. He went to see the Golden Temple, and I went to Bombay. Four days later, Interpol came to my hotel in Juhu, flashing a pic of the character and asking if anyone had seen him. That's when I found out he was fleeing the law and why. He was a Vietnam vet, and apparently had all sorts of PTSD issues. A couple of times we had argued and he threatened to knock my block off. Unfortunately, I knew nothing of his plans after visiting the Golden Temple, so that's all I could tell them. When traveling, it's easy to hook up with travel buddies, and with this one exception, all other times, I've made great friends on the road that were really cool people. This one experience made me really listen to my gut more, and I'm glad. My first real job was when I was 16 at a steak and shake as a waiter. I worked a late shift, and that time of night the only people that came in were large groups of cheap high school students who wanted nine waters, or a small shake and a small order of cheese fries. One night, one of the cooks who I didn't really know asked me for five dollars. I had been working a few hours and had likely barely made that much yet. I asked him what it was for, and he said he needed a haircut. I pointed out to him that he was bald and said no. He asked me once or twice more, then he left me alone. Found out on the news the next day, that there had been a shooting at the steak and shake that I worked at. The cook that had asked me for the money had been shot and died about 30 minutes after I got off of work by a couple of guys he owed money to. They caught the killers, who had apparently driven down to St. Louis from Chicago to kill him. I figure they didn't make the trip for five dollars. 
so I don't hold myself responsible, but still. My sister is a very compassionate person and was always trying to be a friend to the social outcasts at school. She just hated that some kids were picked on and bullied. One kid, to whom she was pretty much his only friend, was Gavin Mandon. I still remember how crushed she was when she heard the news. Gavin had been with his family at their cabin and killed his stepfather and mother while his two sisters were out walking. Gavin then went outside and hid while waiting for his younger sisters to come back. The evidence showed that he actually killed them from his hiding place in the bushes as they were arriving back at the cabin. All this because he thought his mother was too strict with him. It came up specifically in the trial that he killed them all specifically because she forced him to wash the dishes. In college, I worked as a student officer for the campus police station. We handled lockup, escorts, patrol, and bank drops. One day, returning from a bank drop, I ran into a very startled looking man just outside of our new offices. Offices that we had just finished moving into that weekend. Those offices were previously the register's office. This gentleman happened to be the prime suspect in a murder of a graduate that summer. He had followed her from Colorado, and he loved her. When she graduated and he didn't, he went nuts, checked out books on poisons, and poisoned her. She died, not of poison, but because he disposed of her in a drainage tunnel, and she got stuck on the ladder and choked to death on her own shoulder. The reason he looked so panicked is because he, at this time, was still a student and wanted to know if he was able to register, despite being a suspect. When walking into what he thought was a registrar's office, he ended up seeing a sheriff's deputy, a state cop, a local cop, and the campus chief. And I can only imagine what he was thinking as he stammered his intentions. Since they didn't have all the evidence yet, but were well aware of who he was, he was able to walk away. That was when I ran into him, pale, sweaty, and scared for his life. The reason all those guys were there in the first place? The chief was the head of the local police training association, and they were ending a meeting about it. He was later arrested and charged in West Virginia instead of Ohio, which would have given them the death penalty. His name was Dennis Rydbaum. Does this mean that you should be unkind to strangers? Of course not. But it does mean you should be aware of your surroundings and be cautious about who you let into your lives. For you have no idea who people are behind closed doors. If you have a story you would like to see featured here, please contact me through any of my social media links or email me at duchessdark676 at gmail.com. See you next time.